I'm here today with Rick Bookstaber. He is the Chief Risk Officer at the University of California Board of Regents. We're here to talk about his new book, The End of Theory. The subtitle, I think, is magnificent. Financial Crisis, the Failure of Economics, and the Sweep of Human Interaction. Yeah. Let's talk about the difference of the environment that you're modeling and the one yeah. what you might call the presuppositions that underpin a standard economic model. Yeah. So, yeah, standard economics, and, and standard economics may work fine if you're talking about buying dresses and what mm -hmm. happens today mm -hmm. versus tomorrow. But a crisis is something different. Uh, in a crisis, you have interactions between a lot of different people operating in a, a, a much different world. In economics, you have usually one representative agent because everybody's supposed to be the same. Everybody's model consistent, so they're identical. Yeah, in, in fact, the, the basis of rational expectations is everybody's as smart as God, as Lucas or Sargent has said. <laughs> Everybody has God's model. So why do you need many people? Because everybody's going to do the same thing. Everybody optimizes. Everybody understands the way the world works, and they believe the future is going to be drawn from the same distribution as the past. The problem with economics, and it really is most manifest during crises, it's I feel like crises are sort of the stress test or the refiner's fire for, for standard neoclassical economics, mm -hmm. and they, it more represents the real world. I look at four characteristics that are essential in crises that neoclassical economics really can't deal with. I call them the four horsemen of the econopolis. <laughs> <laughs> but the first is computational irreducibility, which is a fancy word, but basically what it means is you can't solve the world through a set of equations. You can't know what's going to happen down the road unless you go down that road. Mm -hmm. And what I like to say is uh, you can't solve for life, you have to live life. And so if you have a computationally irreducible system, you have to use simulations to sort of walk down that path. You can't get it with mathematics. The second characteristic is what's called emergent phenomena. And emergence really means that everybody's doing whatever they want. They're minding their own business. But the end result, the macro result, doesn't look like what each individual is doing. And everybody would be surprised if they saw what the overall world looked like. Mm -hmm. So what happens with a traffic jam is a great example of that. So you can't see the forest for the trees. Yeah. But your interaction among the trees changes the nature of the yeah. forest. And yeah. actually, that's yeah. the whole point, that there's yeah. interaction. Yeah. And economics... The, the whole notion in economics is that people are in a competitive system don't, aren't big enough to have their interactions affect the rest of the system. So you have a world that can't really be solved by mathematics, even though economics does that. You have a world where things can go off the rails, like with stampedes and congestion, and there's no equilibrium rubber band to pull them back on. Mm. And you have a world where because these things can occur, the future doesn't necessarily look like the past. So in economics, there's a notion of things being ergodic, mm -hmm. uh, whereas in reality, the world isn't ergodic. And then the last thing, which, of course, we famously know about, and INET really has focused on, is radical uncertainty, that we can't really know all the things that might occur. We have experiences in the future that we can't think about right now. We invent new mm -hmm. things that we can't even imagine right now. Mm -hmm. And that changes the world in really ways that we can't model. Well, so, I always tell my children that I never understood anything like an internet. I never imagined it yeah. while I was in high school. Yeah. But it's profound in the whole structure of all our commerce, yeah. and the way we uh, conduct our politics and everything 25 years yeah. later. Yeah, and usually what people do is they look at the current and multiply it by three because they want to see what the future looks like. Yeah. But the future inherently, you know, has this radical uncertainty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now your uh, description, say, of portfolio insurance, 2008 LTCM, and this longer-term structural type of uncertainty, they seem to overlap in the sense that when you're in the crisis, you can't ascertain 
when it's gone too far with any precision. You can't plant your feet and say, I know for sure, objectively, yeah. that we've reached the bottom. 20% yeah. down in 1987 in one day yeah. looked pretty extreme by what you might call comparison with yeah. any one-day change in yeah. the history of the markets. But you still don't know in this unprecedented day if it's going to go to 38%. So you're, you're not going to step in front of a falling piano, as they say. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's not even just a falling knife. The key is that there's a dynamic behind what's happening. Uh, and you can't see it if, you know, unless you look at what each agent is doing and how they interact with other agents. Uh, it really bothers me. In, in standard risk management, when things go really bad, they say, oh, it was a tail event. Mm -hmm. A tail event, all that means is we didn't know what the hell happened, but it happened. It's way out here. Yeah. It'll go back to the middle yeah. someday. But will it go further before it goes back yeah. to the middle? Or will it wait a long time before it goes back to the middle? Yeah. yeah it, it's it, hard it's, to know. So you're not, yeah, so you're not seeing the structure. Yeah. And so what I've proposed is a paradigm to replace neoclassical economics. And I'm focusing it with it strictly from the standpoint of crises. But I have to say, and I mentioned early on in the book, that it may well be that the issues that are so apparent during crises and the failure of economics during crises carries through to other more benign settings. Mm. Uh, but maybe there the issues are too small to really seem to matter. So, but I, I stick with crises. And so the, the model that I'm proposing, which is called agent-based modeling, is used, uh, one area it's used a lot is in trying to understand traffic flow and congestion. And it probably is, that's probably the best way to get the handle, a handle on it. If, with traffic flows, you have agents who are the cars or the drivers. Each one has its own heuristic. They're not all optimizing. Someday they might, you know, if we all do get self-driving cars. But, you know, some people speed, some people tailgate, some people change lanes all the time. And each driver, based on his heuristic, is kind of seeing just the world right around him. His environment is not the entire roadway. It's just the cars he sees, the roadway just ahead of him. He observes that. Based on his heuristic, he speeds up or slows down or does the same thing. Everybody else is doing something similar. So imagine that you, in a simulation, pepper the roadway with a lot of drivers drawn from the set of heuristics that drivers tend to have. You then start the clock going in the computer. Everybody sees what everybody else is doing. They interact. They change what they're doing based on that environment. The next period, the next second or 10 seconds, Everybody's environment has changed due to those interactions. They now look at their new environment and change. Mm -hmm. And you do this, and you might discover that if you run the simulation a thousand times, five or ten percent of the time, unaccountably, apparently, some congestion occurs. Uh, those are the emergent phenomena. Mm -hmm. But now you can understand what are the interactions that led to that congestion, and if you keep the simulation going, you can see at what point that congestion a mile and a half down the road tends to dissipate and disappear. So you can see there's sort of an analogy between the congestion and the individual heterogeneous actors interacting with the environment and changing the environment and what happens during a crisis. Mm -hmm. and, and to your point, when you do that, you may be able to get a better sense of when the, the crisis or the congestion will finally run its course. Well, we saw in, in the case of the 2008 crisis mm -hmm. that the Federal Reserve System at one point stepped in and created these called maiden lane facilities yeah. and started saying, I don't know about anybody else, but the taxpayer has a long horizon yeah. and we can buy some of these things and eventually they'll revert back to a normal valuation and they started to create a floor underneath. Yeah. In your work, when you, you envision how to, how you say, take this forward, I mean, when, when the people ask you to come down to Washington, your diagnosis of why things went wrong is, is half the story that they're interested in. Uh -huh. How you're going to avoid it next yeah. time is probably a deep part of their curiosity. Yeah. Where do you take them? Do you well, take them through those maiden lane type lessons? Do you have a vision of a system that will be more socially resilient? 
Uh, yeah, I think, um, well, Ma what Maiden Lane essentially did what needed to be done. The, the market was crying for liquidity. People had to sell. And whether it was because of leverage or for whatever reason, people were selling. They were forced to liquidate. There's all this liquidity demand. Nobody was on the side to yeah. buy. Everybody was scared to death. It was like a musical death. chairs. Yeah, it was like point. musical chairs. And yeah. uh, so finally the government said, well, somebody's got to get this stuff, otherwise they'll just run down to zero. So they created the facility, and they were essentially the liquidity providers of mm -hmm. last resort. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't call it, maybe they were lenders of last resort also, but in this function, they were the liquidity they suppliers. They were buyers of last resort. Yeah, the buyers of last than, resort. Yeah. The problem is, it's the government. They may come in, they may come in in a smart way. They typically would come in too late. But that, essentially, you need somebody to take that function. Because think of the dynamics of what's happening. There's some shock to the market that leads people to, forces people to sell, maybe because they're over leveraged. They're selling in a market that's already weakened due to the shock, drives prices down more, and liquidity weakens. The market becomes less and less liquid. You need to have, and, and not only that, if they can't sell what's under pressure because that market is so weak, they sell other things that they own, and now thing, there's contagion spillover, to, yeah. spill over to other places. Yeah. So ultimately what you need is to be able to have people understand, oh, I've seen prices go down 10, 15, 20, now they're down 25%, but I know what's going on. Because I have a model, a dynamic of understanding the interactions, and I can see that there's this demand for liquidity, and on the basis of having that confidence I will go in and buy. I will come in and, and provide that liquidity, and that will help dampen the downdraft. Mm -hmm. So who can do that? Uh, in the conclusion of my book, I argue that the, the entities that are most suited to do that are not the regulators, they're not the banks, they're not the hedge funds. They actually are the problem. They're the ones who will be forcing the selling. Yeah. They'll be under Fear stress. Fear of redemptions and... Yeah, yeah. and, and the, the banks will be hoarding liquidity. They're not going to want to do anything. It's really the big pension funds and sovereign wealth funds. Mm. And most people don't even think about them. You know, I bet you could go through your whole... P I did my whole PhD and never did anything looking at pension or sovereign wealth funds. But they are a body of huge capital. Mm -hmm. And With they have long leverage. time horizons. Yeah. Yeah. They're not leveraged. So my argument is that they're the ones who might be better suited to be the liquidity providers of last resort if they're armed with the tools that give them the confidence to do it. How did you pick the title, The End of Theory? The, the idea is that everything has been built up based on theory, based on structure, based mm -hmm. on mathematics. It's all really axiomatically, it has a foundation of, of mm -hmm. axioms. Mm -hmm. But the way the world works in times of crisis, certainly, is not theoretical. Mm -hmm. People interact, they have experiences, they change based on those experiences. And, you know, there's no theory, again, for how you live your life. There's the reality of how you live your life. And so when it comes to crises, you have to sort of say we are at the end of theory and we're at the beginning of dealing with the narrative. But I think, and I have a chapter on this, in terms of complexity, it's the same story. That if you go into a more and more complex world, if you start with mechanical, theory works fine. If you go from there to stochastic, theory still works well because it's still an ergodic yeah. process. It's a stable structural system, yeah. plus or minus low vibration. Yeah, and you can model those vibrations. If you go one step further, now you have a dynamical system things get a little more dicey to try to use a theory. You have to really sometimes just simulate and see how things go. Now go one step further to a reflexive system. And now go even one step further to what I call strategic complexity. Uh, Warfare being the best example of that, where people mm -hmm. create complexity strategically for their own benefit. And financial markets, to some extent, th they certainly are reflexive. And in some cases, they even go the next step to be strategically complex. You're no longer in a world where theory can work. 